Good afternoon, everybody. Um, cloud has been kind of teasing the mind of broadcasters and media companies for a couple of years now. And I will tell you that it's the, uh, the next greatest thing. Other vendors in the industry will also tell you the, uh, the same thing. But it's quite easy to kind of lose sight or, uh, or miss why it is that we're actually trying to do this. You know, it is exciting. It is also daunting at the same time. We're used to the kind of technologies that have been around for the last 10, 20, 30 years. As we start looking at cloud, while the concepts are similar, the technology is very different, and we don't have that much exposure or experience with it in the broadcast field. So as we're going to go through the dialogue today, hopefully we're going to address some of these things for you and, and, and with you. So the first question I have for you is, is why cloud? What are the business benefits behind transitioning to cloud? Thanks, Steve. And actually, this is, of course, uh, a top of mind question also in the conversations with our customers. And usually there is, there is five key business benefits that we associate with the cloud. The first benefit is the agility that it gives you. So the ability to set up new services very quickly with a relatively low upfront investment. So you can try out new things. Uh, and one of our customers who has done that is uh, NASCAR. They have set up a new fan site with video on demand content and live video capabilities in a mere three weeks. This was, would not be possible, you know, if you set up uh, this with, uh, with RN and cables. So this is what the cloud can do for you. Secondly, it gives you the, the, the scalability that you need to uh, roll out a new service and if successful, scale it up very quickly. And if not so successful, scale it back down again without having sunk a lot of cost. And that is something that NBC leveraged for the uh, Winter Olympics coverage. Actually, they've been using that for, for several uh, Olympics events now. And uh, the peak event that we had during the Sochi Winter Olympics was about 2.1 million concurrent viewers online watching the uh, US versus Canada uh, ice hockey semifinal uh, during the Sochi Winter Olympics. So that was a, was a record at the time for, for a live event. Another key reason why broadcasters are considering the cloud is the economics. Because if you think about it, Microsoft and other cloud providers are running actually hundreds of thousands, in the case of Microsoft, millions of servers in the cloud. And we can basically give you that compute capacity, that storage capacity, at a price of a single server. So that basically gives you the price uh, digressions that you typically see with scale when you're using the very first uh, gigabyte of storage or the very first uh, compute cycle on a virtual machine. The fourth reason is reach, and reach in terms of not only global reach, but also reach across devices. The cloud enables you to set up new services that play out content to pretty much any device. That could be a smart TV, that could be a set-top box, that could be a tablet, a smartphone, a PC, you name it. And that is something that uh, our customer Telenet, which are part of Liberty Global, the largest cable operator in the world, have recently leveraged to launch their new sports channel. Uh, and they're actually streaming 10 live channels plus a VOD offering through Azure Media Services through our cloud platform. And the last example I would like to mention is, is engagement. Um, driving engagement with audiences by adding more services, adding more value, creating a more engaging experience for the end user. And this is something that TVB Hong Kong have done, basically adding to their TV shows interactive second screen elements that allowed their users to engage with a TV show and that helped them to gather additional information about their user base because they are now no longer just broadcasting to an anonymous audience, but they are gathering data about user interaction as, as they do that. And by the way, that also helped them to bring down the average age of their viewership significantly because they became more attractive for younger viewers. Okay, so I'm, I'm through the hurdle of, of do I want to play with cloud or not. I understand why it is that I'm trying to do it. Um, I understand all the benefits, it's scalable. Uh, I can not only scale up, but I can scale back down again. Um, but I don't have an opportunity to do this as a complete greenfield build. I already have existing infrastructure. H how do I span that gap between existing infrastructure on-premise and trying to move to the cloud at the same time? Very good question. Thanks. And, and that's something that we're also hearing in, in many of our customer conversations. And, and really the key to that is, is if you have 
the same set of development tools, the same set of tools for managing user identities, the same set of tools for managing the systems, um, and the same set uh, of virtualization technology across on-premise and cloud, then it becomes so much easier to manage a hybrid environment. If you think about it, many of the clouds that are in the market today were actually born in the cloud. These companies, um, I don't want to mention name here, names here, only created services for the cloud. They don't have great experience running data centers. Microsoft, on the contrary, was born in the data center and on the desktop. So we have actually decades of experience uh, providing solutions for data centers, virtualization solutions, user identity management solutions, development tools, and system management tools. And we have extended those tools to also cover the cloud. So for instance, if you look at identity management, the active directory services that many of you will know from your on-premise deployment now also span into the cloud and are available as Azure Active Directory services. Second example, the Hyper-V virtualization technology that we have been using for years in our data centers is now also available on Azure and is actually the virtualization technology that we are using in our data center. Our system management tools, System Center, are have been used for many years to run data centers. They can now also manage your cloud services from one console, from one integrated, integrated environment. And if you're thinking about development with Visual Studio or pretty much any other integrated development environment that you might want to use, you can develop services and deploy them either on-prem or in the cloud. And the development environment will actually help you make your services cloud enabled, make sure that they will run properly in the cloud. So this is how we help developers, car partners and customers connect their on-premise components with the cloud components. Great. So my head's in the game now. I understand why I want to move to cloud. I've solved the problem. How do I leverage my inf existing infrastructure and cloud infrastructure? I understand how I'm tying the two together. So now I want to scale. I actually want to leverage the power of the cloud and, and start getting that value. How does Azure solve that problem for me? Very simple answer to that one. Um, because Azure is probably the, the largest cloud out there. We have um, about six times the number of uh, data centers uh, compared to, uh, to Google, about two times compared to, to Amazon. So it's simply the, the largest cloud today with 19 global mega data centers deployed and actually uh, more than 100 smaller data centers. Um, as you can see from this map, we are present uh, globally, including uh, Asia, including uh, China, and this is where we cooperate with a, with a local partner. And if a media and cable uh, company today wants to roll out a new service, and uh, if it's a global operation, you want to be sure that the cloud th that you're building on supports global scalability. So this is on about scalability on the one hand side, but it's also about resilience. Because if one of those data centers go down with a global cloud, with many data centers, you can be sure that we can offer a backup solution and we can actually transition your service and run it in another data center should one data center be disconnected or if some other bad things happen. So this is about scalability, but also about resilience. Cool. So I could talk to any cloud provider and they'll tell me that they've got uh, geographic redundancy and data centers all across the world and they can scale up and they can scale down. But as I'm looking at all these different providers, what should I be considering in trying to choose one other than it's just got the Microsoft name on it? Well, that's a, that's a, um, uh, a key question that, you know, that come up, comes up in conversations with customers. And quite honestly, I would say that all the vendors in the market today, whether it's Google or Salesforce or Amazon or us, we have a, a different heritage, so to speak, when it comes to the cloud. So Salesforce, as you know, started out with customer relationship management. They now have many offerings around um, managing business processes in the cloud. Uh, we, we all know where Google started out, obviously, with, uh, with search. Um, and uh, um, Amazon obviously was uh, initially mostly known for their cost-effective cloud storage and have by now, of course, added a number of additional infrastructure as a service capabilities, as we would call it. The big differentiator for Microsoft, apart from it being the largest cloud out there, is that it's probably the most 
comprehensive, the most versatile cloud, because we're trying to cover all those different scenarios on one platform. So if you know that you just want to do CRM, maybe you know uh, one of those other vendors is a good choice. But if you're looking for a cloud platform that grows with your needs, that addresses different IT and business scenarios, then you should probably consider Microsoft's cloud, which is called Microsoft Azure. And actually, Gartner would agree with that. They've done a little bit of analysis, as you can see here, and I know this is hard to read. So they looked at who is the leader in terms of public cloud storage, and you can see Microsoft uh, is uh, one of the leaders here, together with Amazon. Uh, when you look at uh, virtual machines, again, it's uh, Microsoft, um, together with uh, Salesforce. Then when you look at infrastructure as a service, uh, you will find Microsoft in the leader quadrant again. And if it's platform as a service, again, you will find Microsoft. And Microsoft is the only vendor. Did I switch that off? Hopefully not. <laughs> Microsoft is the only vendor that is actually in the Gartner magic quadrant across those four areas. And if you might be asking yourselves, what is the difference between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, very simply put, Infrastructure service basically means that you're run using storage and virtual machines, but deploying your own services and managing updates, administrating uh, the solution yourselves. Platform as a service basically means you're leveraging Microsoft or partner providing services, and you're not administrating them, you're not uh, concerned with uh, updates and maintaining them. That's all done by either Microsoft or by partners. So generically, cloud solves business problems for, uh, for, for almost any application, but we're not kind of generically in the, uh, the, the technology space. And what we do is very specific to, to television and media. So what is in the Microsoft stack that actually specifically addresses media and broadcast challenges? Yeah, that's, that's something that we are actually quite proud about. And uh, to be honest, one of the reasons why we are at this show uh, why, and why we have been at this show for several consecutive years. And by the way, of course, also at NAB. Because the Microsoft Cloud is not just about uh, cost-effective storage and uh, compute power, but it, uh, this is what you can see here on the left-hand side, so compute and, uh, and storage and uh, disaster recovery capabilities. Where really we add value to transform your business is on the right-hand side here. And just to highlight maybe uh, three items, Mobile engagement, for instance, formerly known as Captain, is actually a digital marketing solution built on our cloud that helps you drive more user engagement with your mobile applications. So this is not just compute and storage, but this is a solution that helps you address a, bu a business need of driving engagement, driving usage of your applications. Another example here is Azure Machine Learning in conjunction with HD Insight. These are big data technologies that help you make sense out of the data that you might be gathering through Azure Mobile Engagement to better understand your audience, to better target your content offerings, to better monetize your audiences. And last but not least, there is Azure Media Services, which uh, is something that you might know. Uh, the Microsoft Media Platform, um, you know, which, have, uh, which has been in use by many broadcasters in on-premise scenarios for uh, video streaming, that is now all available in the cloud for both video on demand and uh, live streaming scenarios. And this is actually an area where we have closely collaborated with Imagine Communications and where Imagine technology is available through the Azure Media Services portal. That's right. We've got the, uh, the Xenium Metafabric uh, technology embedded into your uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Premium Encoder. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, how that works and uh, how you're leveraging the, uh, the Azure platform for that? Sure. So the... Uh, the, the, the um, Xenium Metafabric technology is, is essentially a way of virtualizing business or uh, uh, media-centric processing. So if you think about all the modular gear and, uh, and appliances that you would have stacked up in your, um, your infrastructure today to do standards conversion, audio track shuffling, up mix, down mix, all those little functions, we've essentially virtualized those into tiny little micro modules. So we can then assemble those modules together to create a bit flow or a, a workflow that, that, that targets a specific workflow or business problem around managing content. So in partnership with Microsoft, we deployed this and essentially the same functionality that you'd find in our Selenium Flex file-to-file transcode application, but it's been scaled out 
in Microsoft's cloud environment. So now instead of you having to scale a transcode farm to be able to manage business or usual or even peak demand, you offload that capacity to the Microsoft world and they'll then scale the, uh, the transcode farm behind the scenes. All that same f uh, flexibility and functionality that you can get from the Selenium FX file file product that we're demonstrating back here is also available directly on the Azure platform. So you don't need to come to us for this. You don't need to go and buy physical hardware. You don't need to scale. You just go to the, the Microsoft Azure portal and then start submitting your transcode jobs through that environment. That sounds intriguing. Now, how would a mere mortal like myself solve an actual business problem with that? <laughs> So, so graphically is the answer to that problem. Right, so we can talk about how all these things work. We can describe to you the kind of functionality that's underneath the hood. But when you try and actually assemble these things in the traditional world where we're using physical infrastructure, it was much easier to understand because you could actually see it, touch it, um, and plug it all together. So in this world, we've essentially done the same thing. But instead of using pieces of coax to, uh, to integrate your infrastructure, you're using little white lines and a designer. And each of the components that we need to perform a specific function in our pipeline, we pull from the toolbox, we drop it on the canvas, and then we wire it all together. At each point in our graph, we can actually extract the metadata from that media as it's passing through. So it's not just sidecar metadata associated with, associated with the asset that we're using, but actually kind of frame by frame, sample by sample, we can extract information like, uh, is there actually any vision in the image? Is there audio present? How many tracks of audio is there? Is there closed caption data? And then make decisions as those goes through. So we could have the same kind of processing graph to manage, for example, a stereo workflow as a 5.1 workflow, and the graph would actually be able to make the, uh, the, the or detect as content's moving through what the format is and respond appropriately. Well, we seem to be using a lot of the same te terminology here, like scalability, elasticity, reliability, resilience. And what you're showing here, I immediately see how this would be applicable in a video on demand or, or video streaming scenario. But does this also apply in, in li linear origination, in, in real television? Absolutely. So Versio is our integrated channel platform. Right? So it's uh, master control, it's graphics and branding, it's video clip playback. Um, it's uh, uh, switching between different live sources. All of those, those functions that we need in a traditional origination or master control environment are, uh, are supported in the Versio platform. The Versio platform itself is actually a software-only component. We can leverage uh, hardware if we're running it in the appliance mode, but it is a true software-only solution that can be deployed into a virtualized environment or even into a cloud environment. So we actually have this uh, deployed on the Microsoft booth here at the show if you want to go and see it. Um, so we're demonstrating how easy it is to stand up channels in that environment. But if you just imagine everything that we're used to today in that traditional broadcast chain or that, uh, that service pipeline from inception of content, decode, rewrap, play out, add the graphics and branding, ancillary data, all these, these kind of functions that we need and uh, are supported by physical equipment today, that's all now done in a pure software environment. And then we can distribute to multiple platforms. Right? Once we've dropped our dependency on baseband, we're no longer constrained to the limitations it imposes on us. So from one common platform, not only can I deliver you know, traditional free-to-air or to cable or to satellite, but I can also go over the top or even uh, adaptive bit rate. So Stephen, you spoke about the uh, flexibility of the Senium uh, Metafabric uh, platform and how it can be uh, used to address real-world business problems. But for most broadcasters, the number one real-world business problem still is running linear television effectively in a live environment, in a master control room environment. Could you elaborate a little bit further on how this applies to this type of, you know, top-of-mind scenario? Sure. So this, this should look familiar to you, right? When we were talking about the Selenium Flex file to file and what we're doing with the Microsoft uh, Premium Encoder, you saw a screen that looked fairly similar to this. It was the design tool that we use to, to map out that file-based workflow. Those same components work in a linear environment. The only difference is that our input is not a file source and our output is not a file. Right, it's a live source coming in, whether it's simply 2022-6 for uncompressed or a transport stream. Um, mix in the different files that we actually need for traditional playback, whether they be AMXF or uh, a, a MOV files, it doesn't really matter where they're coming from. Um, add the graphics and branding in there. Uh, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that we've solved your entire play out chain, right? We still have these kind of complex things that we do day in, day out with modular gear. Audio shuffling, uh, dialogue normalization, splitting out uh, uh, audio to do up mix and down mix, uh, making decisions as to what will happen on output based on what the source material is or what the life source may be. So all those things that you're used to solving with very physical um, infrastructure, but it's easy to map, get your, your mind wrapped around. We're doing the same thing here using the Xenium Designer. So this is actually a, a, one of our, our customers blueprints that shows how we take multiple life sources in, how we take multiple file-based assets, make decisions on what the audio track uh, in information is. Is it stereo? Is it 5.1? Is there secondary language? Do we need to what mix down mix? Do we need to do uh, a loudness correction? And each one of these boxes is performing that particular function all the way through till we get to the, uh, the right-hand side of the graph here where we're actually emitting that stream. We're creating the transport stream, we're putting in the live caption information, uh, and, uh, and we're doing the, uh, the, the audio re-embedding. That looks all very, very impressive. You know, in, in, in the opening you said you, we want people to kind of look through the haze of the cloud and understand what it's really about. If you were to tell our audience what is the key takeaway that you would like them to remember about this session? What, what, what would be your, your summary? What, what's the cloud about? Um, I think it's, it's kind of easy, again, to get, get lost in, in the why we're doing this, not the how um, we're doing it. Um, and it's not about changing the wire, right? It's, it's not about going from a piece of coax to a piece of ethernet. It's not just about trying to get to IP. IP is just the very first step in the, uh, the, the process to actually get to software-defined workflows and cloud enablement. If you're going to go back to what the, the business value of this whole thing was, it was the scalability, the agility, be able to stand up new channels, take them back down. I mean, we, we've always been able to, uh, to scale up in this industry, right? You just write a big check, wait for your equipment to arrive, rack it, stack it, power it, commission it, and you scaled up. But you can't scale back down, right? You can't return that equipment to the vendor after you've used it and get your money back. I mean, you can turn it off, ignore it for seven years, depreciate it, and then pretend it never happened. But in this world, we actually can scale back. So the value in this is not just getting to IP. It is actually getting all the way through to cloud enablement and software-defined networking and software-defined workflows, right? It's about driving your business with configuration, not the physical topology of your, your infrastructure. So I'd ask you the same question. Well, um you know, we as Microsoft pride ourselves in being a company that enables organizations and people to achieve more. And we think of the cloud as actually an enabling technology for the media and cable industry. And what it does enable it, it does enable you to adapt. It does enable you to adapt more quickly and more effectively than any on-premise solution that you could buy today. So think of cloud as enabler of adapting to a changing world in media, giving you the flexibility, the agility, the elasticity, the scalability that you need to do that. That would be, for me, the key takeaway.